So I'm Colin Cox, Director of Public Health for Cumbria. And of course, over the last two years, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 has had a profound impact on Cumbria and on the people who live here. Notably, about 1,800 people have died of COVID-19 throughout the last two years. And we still have a lot of people suffering from the effects of long COVID. But communities in Cumbria are amazingly resilient. And one of the, the truly amazing things that happened throughout this was the, the way in which communities came together incredibly quickly to, to mobilise themselves, to provide support to people in the community who were more vulnerable. Uh, and that's something for which I'll always be profoundly grateful. But it's also had a profound impact on people's mental health and well-being. And this short film allows a small number of people from across the county to talk about that in their own words, giving them space to talk about the impact that the pandemic has had on their health and well-being. Like I say, everyone's got the story, haven't they? It is really sad and you, you do just want to go out and live your life as much as you can. I feel the world I live in has changed. It was very isolating. I think communities are stronger since then. I don't know how Covid's affected us for the foreseeable future. I know how it's affected me for the foreseeable future, which is, um, you know, I don't know what, what future I really have other than here and online. My name's Jack, and 18 year old. I live in a, a little farm just outside Appleby in a little village called Dufton. So we were all sat around in the library between two little lectures, and all our phones buzzed, and it said, uh, College is shut from now, from tomorrow morning until the, uh, the end of the Easter holidays, which would be four weeks, which is the same as everywhere else, really, wasn't it? They were t talking about just the end of the Easter holidays, you know, home by Christmas almost, wasn't it, sort of thing. Hi, my name's Michael Green. I, uh, I live in the Raffles Estate in Carlisle. My daughter, who five years ago was diagnosed with kidney failure, and she was really poorly on dialysis, and she had dialysis at home and in the hospital, and obviously we were testing to get a kidney, me and my wife, and obviously before COVID and before lockdown and what have you, we actually got the chance to give my daughter a kidney. We were in hospital about a week. George was in maybe two. Yeah, and then she came home and it took, took a long time to recover. And obviously, while we were starting to recover, all hell broke loose, you know. My name's Alex Martin. I live in Alston. I've lived here for quite a number of years. When I heard about COVID and realised how many people were ending up in hospital, um, particularly people who had lung problems and heart problems, I realised that having both heart disease and lung disease, I really needed to isolate and to not um, go out or let people into my house. Consequently, I have um, been shielding for the last two years since COVID. My, my name's Ross Park. I work here, Adam Reed and Hockin, funeral directors with my wife, my mother-in-law, father-in-law, and three colleagues who work full-time with us. We do get emotionally involved with the families, and it's important that you do that in order to give them what they need. I enjoy being able to look after their loved one. Leading up to the first lockdown, I felt quite anxious and quite scared, I guess, because obviously it was all new, we didn't know what was going on, we didn't know how long it was going to last, and I'm a very social person and I loved being at college, I would come in on my days off, so knowing that I couldn't come into college, it was, it was quite scary, it was like, what am I meant to do with myself now? My name is Dana Porton, I'm 38 years old. I was quite happy to go into lockdown because at that by that point, I think I was quite scared and worried about what was going to happen with us, our family. So I was quite happy to just hunker down. My name is David. Um, I'm a support worker here at Burnley Court. I've worked here for just over two years. Well, I started here in August 2019. It was in March 2020 that that the restrictions came on for visitors and such like for COVID. Um, but there was talks of it for a month or so before that. The 
week before the week before lockdown was an awful week for us because dad got made redundant on the tuesday my nan died on the wednesday and then my uh, and then my dog that uh, dog didn't die nearly had a very big problem on the thursday as well so that was a week before lockdown so it was very very strange um so and it, it was maybe done because it went bust. So there was no statutory pay or anything like that. No furlough. I was the only one on furlough, which is like ridiculous, really, isn't it? Having a 16 year old on furlough when there's two working adults that aren't. We went into lockdown, started homeschooling the kids, and then we just had to take on this whole new world of figuring out what we're going to do. My husband continued working over the, the, the lockdown because he's in manufacturing and they kept going. So it was just me and the boys at home. So he would leave for work in the morning and basically come home and then take all his clothes off at the door and go straight into the shower before he even, you know, came over to us. And so it was quite scary. Well, I live in the countryside and um, I'm surrounded by fields and sheep and cows, um, which is great. I do love it. Um, but obviously, sometimes that can leave me feeling isolated. But during the lockdown, I think it was a real advantage and benefit for me. Um, because I could spend most of my day outside in the garden or I went on a lot of bike rides um, and really just living in the countryside I think was a huge benefit for me. I think the restrictions had a huge effect on my education um, most prominently because I couldn't come into college and you couldn't get that one-to-one -one support from your tutors which I think is huge because a lot of people in a sense maybe gave up and thought well now that I can't go in and I don't have that in place then what's the point? I think as well a lot of people lost opportunities coming into college and meeting people gives you a lot of opportunities and obviously being sat at home and not being able to come in it, it strips away them opportunities from young people. When we were in the Freemans there was a couple of cases in the RBI, two of the first cases apparently in the country and when we came home and the hospital were in touch a lot and we, we knew there was something pretty big going on you know we went into lockdown and that was that was a very difficult situation. Georgia was she had to have the district nurses every day. And they were coming in like bloody space women, you know. And we were putting masks on before I'd heard of a mask. If I'd have lived in a flat in Manchester or Carlisle even, I think it would have been horrendous. But here is absolutely it's a wonderful place to live. And I can look out of my window and see hills and, and beauty and and people were still walking their dogs, so I could see people walking along the street. Um, also, I've had more people in my living room via Zoom than ever I did before. So I haven't been lonely at all, really. Um, I regularly have 20 to 30 people every week doing a Zoom with me, and that's still true. Um, so even though I'm still shielding two years later, because um, there's no way I want to risk take getting COVID, I, um, I, it's, it's fine, it's fine. And as far as um, provisions were concerned, I'm afraid that um, I use uh, the local, uh, well, not the local, one of the supermarkets that deliver. And Amazon is my friend, although I wish it wasn't. <laughs> I didn't see another person for about a couple of months since the first, you know, in the lockdown. We hardly ever went out on the farm. We, I remember fencing for about felt weeks, I, and I saw someone on the footpath, and I'm like, that's the first non laid law that I've seen for ages. I was obsessed with this COVID. I was obsessed with it. I couldn't sleep because of it, watching the, the news, you know, because I had it in my head. If she caught it, she was going to die. But yeah, I just for, the, for all the love I had in my job and the people in the job, I just yeah, I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care for money anymore. My dad's about a few few words, to be honest. But like, I I I love that man. I love my dad. Like we kidney buddies, we call each other kidney buddies. And I knew he was feeling down. He didn't have to say it. You could just see it. You know. I just I left my work iPad and my diaries and my bankies and I just left the wee note. I said I want me back. I just couldn't deal with. People, you know, I just... I remember the day that um, visitors to Burnrigg Court were restricted because um, there was a family in with one of our service users and they came, the, the, uh, as they left uh, the room, they came and said to me, David, I, I don't 
I don't know when we'll be able to come back. And I said, well, I was quite, quite upset by that. And I said, well, you do know your relative will get the best possible care from us. Um, then they went after that and I've, I don't recall seeing them since. Um, we have had visits, um, window visits, room visits, depending on the, the threat from COVID as to how we manage things in here. One of the lasting memories that I will take from it all was in the first lockdown when we were dealing with families who had loved ones passing with COVID because that was when it, it was quite busy for us at times and the tale of a family who couldn't actually get access to a care home and they watched their mother, grandmother, mother-in-law die through a window. And to me, that's almost barbaric. Whether they get over that fully ever, who knows? That's a, that's a tough one to take away. There are all sorts went on in, in there as well. The way we were had, we, we didn't have any guidelines initially as to what we had to do, how we had to deal with the deceased. And we had to go with our best guess. When the guidelines did come, it wasn't far away from what we were doing anyways. But the fact those families couldn't see their mother, father, brother, sister, whoever, that had a profound effect on them. But also it made us look at things differently because we were told to minimize our exposure ourselves. And the job we do, we are basically looking after that person, that deceased, with the utmost respect and dignity. And I think at times we couldn't afford them that because of the restrictions that were in place for us. And that, that was sad, the fact we couldn't actually do that. Um, I think it changed a lot of people. I think it's scarred everyone, hasn't it, in their own little way, you know. You know, I wouldn't like to sit here and think, God, we were so well. well so there was a lot of people losing family members and stuff, you know. God help what they must have went through, you know. We couldn't go to funerals and stuff like that. It must have been awful. You know, it must have been awful. Quite lucky, two of our best friends live a few doors down, and you know, off of the fence, you could have a chat. And you know, and she works at bless her, she worked at the hospital right through, she's a nurse, you know. And one of the pictures in my head, I'll never forget. I, I remember seeing her sitting at her back doorstep crying with like the mask mark on her face, and I just wanted to give her a cuddle, you know, but you couldn't, you know, you just couldn't. Mm -hmm. So every Thursday, eight o'clock, we clap for her. Mm. Everybody went out to clap for the essential workers. And it was almost as if the deaths weren't to be recognised. Funeral directors as essential workers were never mentioned. Not that we want a pat on the back for it, but it would have been nice just to hear that. Um, but I went out there every Thursday, same as everyone else did. You know, pan with a wooden spoon and people doing what they need to do. It wasn't actually, I don't think, as an industry, we were recognised in among that. When we first heard about COVID, I was on the parish council, I was a parish councillor, and I was aware that we needed to do something because it was obvious that COVID was going to come all across the country. And if people were going to have to shield or isolate, 
or stay away in, in lockdown, then we needed to find a way to be able to support people. Um, so we started, I started with the local um, county councillor, a group called um, AMERG, which is also the More Emergency Response Group, which we, um, we started online. And because I'd been um, used to using Zoom myself for a couple of years, I was able to get loads of people online. I opened up a, a, a Zoom account and uh, we started being able to um, work towards supporting the whole community. It has brought people together, no matter what you say. There's a other group of people, but it's the unity and the amount of time that you think I'd need to... What if Covid happened again? The last thing I said to them was, I really hate you, please don't talk to me again. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and of course it's brought like I don't understand morbid or anything but it has brought definitely a bit more thing because everybody could get Covid and anybody could be seriously ill uh, of Covid so it, it's definitely like a time to definitely get together again and, and have, you know make sure that you like everybody which sounds really hippie I know it sounds really hippie but uh, do you, I'm sure you understand I think communities are stronger since then people are more aware of other people, aware of them being there. Um, I know definitely on, on a, where we live in Cleetham, it's a tight community anyways, but it made the community tighter. Um, little groups set up or big groups, it turned out to help um, do chemist runs for people who couldn't get out of the home go shopping for the aged people. Uh, so I think it's a positive that the community got tighter, which is strange when you think we weren't supposed to be mixing, but somehow we just made people tighter. Um, I remember the time when you couldn't leave your home or your garden, then they opened it up slightly where you could, you allowed, and you, and you couldn't meet anybody, but then they allowed you to meet um, you could sit in your own garden and your neighbour could sit in their own garden. I remember on VE Day, we had a, we had a, my wife and I had a party with our next door but one neighbours sat in our own gardens. And we could hear there was a musician in the next cul-de-sac and we could hear them playing, it was quite nice. As far as I'm aware, really, the only positive that we can take out of the whole thing is the fact that we've learned to communicate online with each other which has opened up huge, better possi possibilities, especially for people like myself who are vulnerable and lonely. You know, maybe they can, uh, maybe people can meet up with each other on Zoom more often and stave off loneliness. I think another positive is, is we have um, started to communicate with people outside of our local environment because Zoom is available and Skype and WhatsApp. You know, we are meeting up with more people and therefore, hopefully, getting a greater perspective than what we would if we were just stuck in our little local communities. And by little local, I mean Carlisle or Manchester is little local. I don't just mean Alston. I saw a change in the way people treated each other, as I definitely saw a community come together and people be kinder to each other. Um, as people were more willing to support small businesses, that was quite a big thing. Um, and everyone said, go local you know, help the locals as their businesses were suffering. So I'd definitely seen more of a community spirit and um, people came together, even just in my small village, when we'd go on walks and you'd bump into others, you'd, would, you'd have more of a chat than you used to. Um, so I think more friendships were formed and people did come closer in that sense. I think everyone's got to, I don't know, they've got to appreciate what they've got more. You know, I really do and just, don't take life for granted. You know, I can't wait to get back and hold it, and and I think we'll enjoy them all this time. And the grandkids, you know, they're our lives. You know, you know, we love them so much, and we just want to give them what we can, and you know, just enjoy life.